Being OFD or originally from Dorchester, as I think the audience would know, it is a great pleasure for me to be back in this wonderful part of the world. I wanted to talk with you today about spending $5 billion plus on innovation. The context for doing that is the company that I work for, GE, and I think it's a company that many of you in this room own. If you have an investment in either a public or a private pension fund, then certainly you own some GE stock. If you have an investment in a 401k plan, you're in some index fund or a mutual fund, there will be GE stock in there as well. So I'd like you to think today with me as owners of this great company. Now here's what GE looks like. These are the industrial businesses of GE. We have a financial services businesses too, business too, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. It's about a hundred plus billion dollar industrial company with a range of businesses that cross healthcare, energy spaces, oil and gas, and we're gonna walk through how we might think about spending money on innovation to provide better value for our customers, make the world a better place, and to drive benefits for you, our shareholders, so that you can provide for your families, secure a better retirement, maybe give to your favorite causes, or for those of you in Boston, buy tickets to the Red Sox. So, first thing you should know is that the fundamentals for innovation are very, very strong. We will make much better materials going forward. Electronics get better all the time. They get smaller, more capable. You see this in your daily lives. And computing power gets faster, gets much more prevalent, and we can handle amounts of data that were inconceivable just a few short years ago. These trends will continue into the future. So with that as an underpinning, you should go forward with great confidence that we can make much better products, deliver much better services into the future. So now, Thomas Edison was one of the founders of GE, and he would say that I find out what the world needs, and then I invent it, not the other way around. So I'd ask you to think about some big trends going on in the world as you think about where we should place our bets. Now, the first big trend is in aviation. The number of passengers around the world is doubling in the next few years, certainly driven by Asia, but it's going on everywhere. And with that, the number of flights are going up. And as you well know, the price of oil has gone up very dramatically, and we think it will stay up for a very long time. So our customers around the world are pushing hard to get new airplanes to meet this demand, and they have to have very fuel-efficient airplanes because the cost of fuel is such an important factor in their ongoing economics. So you see a wave of innovation going on for new airplanes, and the, the benefits you get for a new airplane come two-thirds from the engine itself. And so our first bet is in aviation, where we're developing new jet engines. Now, if you like technology, innovation, new products, you have to love that beautiful jet engine. It is loaded with high technology, great innovation. It's got new polymer composite materials in the front end. Those wavy blades are, are made out of that. You have ceramic composites going into the back end. These are new materials above and beyond current day capabilities. You have new casting technologies for the back end. You have new compressors designed with high, computing, high performance computing. They're much more efficient. The fan generates about half the noise of what it used to. We have 3D printed parts in this new jet engine, just as Ben described to you. They're real, they're not coming, they are happening in this engine today. That helps us get the emissions out of this aircraft to be half of what it was before. And the fuel efficiency is so much better that we're gonna generate, as we add these into our fleet, $34 billion of benefit to our customers every year. Now to put that in context for you, that amount of money is way more that all the airlines in the United States make as profits every year. So it's a very consequential innovation. To develop one of these new engines costs well over a billion dollars. So we're putting a lot of money into this and we're gonna drive a lot of customer benefit. The next area you might think about is power and water. Everybody needs electricity. We couldn't have this broadcast today without electricity. But even so, with great modern technology, there are over a billion people who don't have access to that. And CO2 emissions keep going up. Folks are worried about that. And clean water is something that a billion people still don't have. And industries around the world consume more and more water. They need better ways to clean it up. Here's an example about renewables. We're investing in renewables. They are going mainstream. Look at wind. Wind is making up 
an ever-increasing um, percentage of the generation around the world. In the United States, we have a, the capacity equivalent to 52 coal-fired plants online today. There are six countries that have over 10% of their electricity coming from renewables. We've put a lot of money and in innovation into this space, and we've driven down the cost of electricity from what used to be 15 cents to now in the range of 5 to 7 cents a kilowatt hour, and that is getting very close to being competitive with fossil generation, even without subsidies. And solar is coming right behind this. But having said that, we're going to need fossil generation for a long time to come. And gas, as we'll see in a minute, is a more prevalent resource than it's ever been. And so gas turbines are a, 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 an energy driver of, of choice. When I started in GE, we used to make plants that were 50% efficient. We were very proud of it. Today, we're delivering more than 60% efficient power plants. And in the future, not too far in the future, we'll deliver 70% efficient power plants. These machines are very flexible, so they can start and stop quickly. And that helps us to put more renewables online because the wind blows at varying rates, the sun goes in and out with cloud cover, and these machines can respond to that, keeping our grid rock steady. Emissions used to be about 200 parts per million for NOx, now they're down to one. And these electricity generating machines are still lowest cost. So what you're seeing in the world today is a lot of renewables going in and a lot of gas turbines going in to complement that. In the water space, today, in municipal water, for example, we use about 3% of the electricity in the United States just to clean up municipal waste. Tomorrow, we're going to find ways to clean up that water using the solids to make electricity. So it will be a net gain, not a net drain. And we'll get cleaner water, cheaper, for people all around the world. Then there's the oil and gas space. There is an awful lot of oil still to be found. It's coming from tougher and tougher places. And giving the developing world's appetite to live as we do, we project that the, the demand for oil will still increase by 50% in coming years. And natural gas, particularly in the United States, with the advent of technologies to retrieve shale gas, has had a very significant boom. Production in the United States is up 60%. And with that surge in production, prices have gone down over 70%. That's a remarkable benefit to every one of us. And with that, believe it or not, CO2 emissions in the United States are actually going down, while other countries like Germany and countries in Asia are going rapidly up. There's really, for the first time in my life, the real promise that we can have energy independence in the United States. So this is an important area that needs a lot of technology. Technology to get oil and gas from strange places, like in the first place, under the sea. That platform that was in the previous slide above the ocean will someday soon go down below the ocean, driving incredible cost advantages and efficiencies. We need to be able to go into harsher environments. As we dig deeper wells, the pressures and temperatures are higher. The materials are more corrosive. We need to be able to clean up the water. You may know that any well anywhere has some water that comes up with the oil. We want to clean that up and reuse it. You need distributed power to get that oil and gas at drilling sites. You need to find ways to use these unconventional fuels by compressing natural gas and putting them into trucks to drive new efficiency and emissions reductions in our US fleets. And as I'll talk in a minute, there's an enormous amount of data that we can use coming out of these fleets to make the costs go down much farther while the reliability and safety goes ever upward. And then some other areas that use energy, like transportation here, locomotive. The US regulations are driving emissions down by 90%. We have technologies to do that. And with the low cost natural gas available in the United States and in other places, there's a push going on to change from all diesel fuels to natural gas, which cost about a tenth of the cost of diesel fuels. And there's a need to have smart grids that can handle the reliability and, and variability of wind and solar resources. We have demonstrated the ability to put over 30% renewables on grids. So we have lots of room to grow renewables in the United States and other places. And in lighting, one of the old line GE products and something that we all use, you may know that incandescent bulbs are being phased out in the United States and other places. So at the end of this year, 60 watt bulbs that many of us have in our homes that are incandescent will no longer be in production. The good news is we're moving very rapidly toward light emitting diodes or LED technologies that last a lot longer, 
an incandescent bulb might last 800 hours, an LED bulb can last 20 years, and it's so much more energy efficient that your cost of ownership will go from maybe $7 for a light bulb a year to down toward a dollar. And these LED light bulbs, while they're still expensive, are coming down in price very, very rapidly. And then there's healthcare. You all know about the cost of healthcare in the United States going toward a fifth of our economy. You know that many of us, like me, a baby booner, are getting older, and we face into diseases like Alzheimer's and cancer. And the developing world needs healthcare. And here's an example of the divergence you see very often in the developing world. A big city hospital in China is world class, absolutely great facilities. But a rural hospital in China has almost nothing. It's very rudimentary, very tough place to get treated. So we're developing technologies for all of this. Here's ultrasound, uh, a non-radiation way of getting great images in the body. If you go to into a hospital today or just in the recent past, you would see a device like the one on the left. It's fairly big, it's fairly clunky, but it's quite effective. Today, we have a device that you can put in the doctor's pocket, so primary care physicians can use this to make diagnoses in their office at a much lower cost. And very soon tomorrow, you will see devices where all of the electronics and all the capabilities actually in the probe. So you can plug a probe wirelessly or with a cord into something like your iPad, and the doctor will be able to carry that around and go anywhere they want, including to places like rural Africa where there's very little care. They don't know whether to send the mother to the hospital or not. We're going to make these things so smart that even a midwife with very little training will know how to treat a pregnant mother. Then we do what we call in-country, for-country innovation. These things take place in the countries where the innovation is needed. So for instance, in the United States, we might need a high-level, first-class, world-class CAT scanner to get anatomical images. In China, you might need a much lower cost to serve those things like in those rural hospitals. And in India, you might need a lower cost still. India spends $50 billion on healthcare for a population of about a billion people. We spend $2 trillion on a population of 300 million. So they need much lower cost products. And what we find is the local teams can invent products for them much more effectively than other teams. And what's happening is a virtuous chain where those locally developed products come back to the developed world and serve needs there as well. And then there's the ability to do brain scans. Up until recently, we could get beautiful anatomical images of brains, but only that. Today, we can do what's called functional imaging of your brain, so we can see how your brain responds to thoughts. We can even maybe someday tell what you're thinking from the images we get of your brain. But more important, tomorrow, we'll be able to see things like Alzheimer's disease developing in your brain. And we're very hopeful that the drug companies will develop drugs that can blunt this deadly disease. And so our imaging capability will enable them to see if their drugs are effective, getting to market much faster. And finally, in cell therapies, for many, many years, we had what are called small molecule drugs. Lipitor, statin is a common one that you might know. And now we've moved into large molecule drugs, or these are protein-based therapies, like Herceptin, which is used to treat breast cancer. This is a move toward personalized medicine, because Herceptin is targeted for women who have certain genetic dispositions, and we know it has a much better chance of affecting them. But tomorrow, and tomorrow is very close to today, we're finding ways to extract your own cells, to purify them, to grow them, and then to reinsert your own cells such as T cells, which are a strong part of your immune system, and they can go back and fight and defeat growing cancers. So one more thing is the, what we call the industrial internet. This is the idea of making machines brilliant, putting sensors on them so they can find out what's going on in their environment, connecting them up all around the world, adding technology so they can store information in the cloud, and finally, and most important, adding analytics that can tell us what's going on. An example here is the jet engine we talked about before. It has an array of sensors. Today, we get data basically once a flight. So we might be able to look at the data and tell you that something happened to your engine and tell you how to go to fix it. That's what we call monitoring and diagnostics. But tomorrow, we're going to get data full time in the flight. This is enormous amount of what's known as big data. People talk about big data as Facebook's clip. Uh, clicks. This is way more data than you get Facebook clicks in anybody's lifetime. What we can do with that is see not only 
what, what has happened, but we can project what will happen, enabling our customers to support their install base much more effectively. We're doing that today for engines, also for airplanes, the whole system on the airplane, and we're moving very rapidly to fleets of airplanes so we can take their inefficient operations and make them much more efficient and productive. We're gonna do this for engines, for locomotives, MR machines, wind turbines, and on and on and on. So we can envision a world where devices are connected up, we're gaining information about how they behave, we can project their behavior and treat them much more effectively. We talk about a 1% gain in productivity, which we can easily see. If you do that across the fleet of, of machines that we have, we can save our customers $300 billion over the next 15 years. That is clearly in sight. So I want to end up on how we innovate. We have 50,000 technologists in the company. I'm the chief technology officer of the, of the company, so I get to work with all of them driving great innovation, but that is not enough. We need to be connected to the broader world. We have deep connections with big companies. You might think that as naturally, you'll see names of big global companies there with whom we innovate. We have connections with great universities in every part of the world to get the academic learnings into the industrial world as quickly as we can. We have connections with governments, certainly with the US government, but governments in the EU, governments in India and China to advance their innovation needs. We have in-country, for-country activities, as I mentioned. We're building customer innovation centers for our customers to come in and help us understand what they need. We actually have one of these in Chengdu to get at the rural China needs, just as I was describing to you. And then we have venture capital activities. We're investing in startup companies so we can see that rich world of innovation. And finally, there's you. We've made calls for innovation in what we call eco-imagination, for energy efficient devices, and what we call health, health imagination for breast cancer solutions. We've looked at flight analytics. We've looked at 3D printing even. And we've put out calls for innovation. We've had many, many, many thousands of responses. So I challenge you to join in with us, make this a world a better place through incredible innovation. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>